Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be here at Secure Insurance and welcome you to our Spring Tell Talk featuring Dave Gross and Garth Wasinski, sponsored by United Way Fox Cities Emerging Leaders. My name is Brenton Teeling, Vice President at Legacy Private Trust Company in Nina and United Way Fox Cities Emerging Leaders Chair. We are thrilled to hear from Dave and Garth today. And before we begin, I'd like to take just a moment to recognize and thank our Emerging Leaders sponsors. Our platinum sponsors are Amcor, Alta Resources, Integrity Insurance, Kimberly Clark, Miller, and U.S. Bank. Our gold sponsors, Godfrey Kahn and Menasha Corporation. Our silver sponsors, Community First Credit Union, Legacy Private Trust Company, Myron, Secure Insurance, and our bronze sponsors, Bergstrom Automotive and Premier Best Western Bridgewood Resort Hotel. We have just a few housekeeping matters before we begin today. Please note that all attendees are muted and in listen only mode. Portions of our presentation today will have shared slides. For optimal viewing, please use your side-by-side -side speaker mode during the shared slides. Lastly, we thank all of you that submitted questions as part of the registration process. To submit questions during today's presentation, utilize the Q&A box. We have many great questions and we'll address as many as possible today. If you've joined us in the past for Emerging Leaders event, welcome back. If you're joining us for the first time, again, thank you for being here and we'd love to welcome you to Emerging Leaders. Being an emerging leader is a great way for young leaders to invest in lasting change in our communities. Each emerging leader gives $500 or more each year to United Way Fox Cities and is recommended for those ages 40 and under. We are so proud of the impact that we have in our community. As you saw on the previous slide, we have grown from just a handful of emerging leaders in 2008 to nearly 1,000 strong today. If you'd like to learn more or better yet, get involved, please visit any of our social media pages, United Way Fox City's website, or utilize the uh, chat feature during today's presentation. Being an emerging leader is a way to connect to other emerging leaders through to events like today's Tell Talk and other events that we host throughout the year. Most recently, we've hosted Dr. Imran Andrabi and Becky Tukshur. And in the past, we've also welcomed special guests, including John Quinones of ABC News and Aaron Rodgers, who joined Mr. John Bergstrom for a Q&A chat. In addition to our Tell Talks, we also host other personal and professional development events that support and enhance our career development and overall well being. We also have engaging volunteer opportunities, such as our annual signature event, the Valentine's Family Festival, or this year's Spring into Summer event. Lastly, we host social events to bring our uh, emerging leaders together, and those will soon hit the calendar again. So keep an eye out, and we'd love for you to join us. I'd now like to introduce our co moderator for today's event, Samantha Purcell of Secura. Samantha is a LINK committee member and will introduce our special guest today. Samantha? LINK, Lead Impact Network Change, is a group of individuals that are 30 and under who are passionate about giving their time, talent, and generous donation of $250 per year or $5 per week towards United Way. If you are interested to learn more about LINK, please scan the QR code on the right-hand side of your screen to learn more. All right. Well, welcome everybody. As you just heard from Brenton, we will be having our guests today as our future CEO of Secura, as well as our current CEO of Secura, presenting on being the CEO of your career. I am Samantha Purcell. I am going to be the co-moderator for today. I'm a project manager at Secura Insurance, and I serve on the United Way Link Steering Committee. Hi, thank you for joining us today. It's wonderful to have our emerging leaders on with us and, and LINK members as well to our wannabes as well. Um, I'm Dave Gross, President and CEO of Secure Insurance for only five more days. So today I can say just about anything I would like uh, because <laughs> I get to turn it over to this next guy. I've been with Secure for almost 25 years. It's been my honor and privilege to lead this great organization and we look forward to talking to you today. Hi, I'm Garth Wasinski. I'm our current Chief Operating Officer. And with any luck, uh, when Dave goes and moves into retirement, I will be voted on as our next CEO. 
Excited to be here with you today and look forward to the conversation. And I'm Brie Voster, Specialty Lines Underwriter with Secura, United Way Link Steering Committee member, and, and the other today. So to get started, Dave's going to kick us off talking about Secura's demographics. So our subject today would be the CEO of your career. I, we wanted to show you just a little bit about what Secura is and our thousand plus employees that we have. You can see by the pie chart that we are well suited for the future, that we have all ages of individuals. And it's our job as leaders to engage them all in their careers, to be honest and open as to what they want to do in their career. And, and let's face it, in today's world, there's probably not an exact career path. And so between you and us figuring that out together, um, it really works well. You can see the average tenure of our associates is nine years, um, but a third of our associates also have um, at least 10 plus years. And that's really important because uh, we've hired over 400 people in the last two plus years. And so it's been pretty cool investment in talent. More importantly, we do an annual survey every year as one feedback mechanism. And we find that 98% of our associates are saying they're either satisfied or very satisfied in their careers here. And that's a moving target, right? We have to earn that. They have to earn that at all times. And that's our job to do so. Thanks, Dave. Garth, would you talk to us a little bit about a pipeline succession plan versus a portfolio succession plan? Sure, I'll talk a little bit about both and how we use both of them here at Secura. So first off on the pipeline, it's a traditional model of some of you might call it silos where you start in an organization, you start for us, you could start in the claims division and you'd spend 25 years of having a great career in that claims division. We compete with a knowledge worker and we need a lot of people who would be interested in that type of career path where they become subject matter experts, deep knowledge workers, well sought out by others for their constant expertise within that area. Under Carrie Shear's leadership, we also developed something we call the portfolio model. When we do our hiring and we do planning for the future, most of the entry level hires we make are recent college grads. And we know that that group of people is gonna probably have seven or eight different jobs within their career. And we created that portfolio model because we want many of these people to have that opportunity to have all seven or eight roles with us. So the people who are moderating today, they're examples of a portfolio model for Secure. They started out in one area of the company, they earned it, earned an opportunity to do something different with us. And now they're off to a career working in a different area of the company. We believe that both will be needed for us to succeed long-term, but we're really excited that Secura is an organization that really values people who can be real, earn it, have fun, which is one of our mantras. And under that portfolio model, it gives people an opportunity to jump around. You could work in an underwriting operation. You can move to the IT operation. You can move to marketing. You can move all over our company with this type of a model. And really it's, it's based on you earning it in the current role that you're in to earn that opportunity to go and do something else with us. So both will be important for us in our future. And we're really excited to have success stories like the two moderators today talking about their portfolio experiences. Dave and Garth, what does it mean to be the CEO of your career? I'll start with that. Um, so a long time ago, I learned that uh, opportunities are, um, they don't always come when you plan for them, right? And you have to be ready. And so to be the CEO of your own career means you be the best in the position that, that you are in today and you raise your hand when you want another opportunity. Uh, literally, figuratively raise your hand. You talk to your boss, you talk to HR, you own your own career path. And, and with that, then you make it known to your organization. As an emerging leader, you know that, right? That there are opportunities in your own firm and that you can find those opportunities if you're willing and you're the best at what you do in your own position. So for me, it has always meant uh, to just uh, plan out where you wanna be, plan out what you wanna do. And if it's not working at one firm, you know what, there's lots of firms out there that can use your talent. And so um, when we lose people, we hope they come back um, even better and stronger. And we do have a lot of boomerang people who do come back to us. Yeah, I would add on to what Dave said. You know, we've got many different models of what that might mean here. And so for some, they need a formal plan and they really want to plan out what that might look like. And for others, they don't may not have a five page document. They just want to really excel in the role they're in. And as opportunities come their way, they may or may not be interested in them. And just to really find that happy medium of doing well in the career you're in, being satisfied with that career, and also being open-minded to opportunities that could come your way. 
So for me, it's, it's a combination of potentially having a formal path and also being open-minded to the informal things that come your way. But all along that way, you're going to hear us talk a lot about earning it and earning it where you are and creates that opportunity for you to do other things. Dave and Garth, what types of career risk did you take on your journey to CEO and how did they shape you? I could say, I'll, I'll talk first on this one. I'll, I'll say, uh, so we're in a relatively new building and I was the sponsor for the building. And uh, one of the stories I shared when we were going through this discussion ahead of time was just to talk through how there was a, a leader here that talked about how leading that project isn't going to help your career, but it sure could hurt it if you screw it up. So it wasn't I'm, me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to say we're in the building, so it wasn't screwed up that bad. Uh, I think another career risk I took, though, was just a belief in some other people. When I was the leader within HR, there was a strong performer on that team, Kara Wedig. She also had an interest in doing other things for the organization. And through nudging and pushing a little bit, pushing her outside of HR and going into the operation, where she developed an interest in CI. So she had some great plans for what she wanted to do in the CI space, but the organization wasn't necessarily ready. And so Dave would say that I always had money hidden in the budget somewhere. <laughs> so I helped fund some of the things that she was very interested in doing, and then she was able to earn it on her own. So some of that career risk, I think, is also having a belief in others and helping them through their career, even though there might not be formal things set in place for you as well. Thank you, Gareth. For me, uh, I had 17 years of working before I joined Secura. And in that career, before I got here, there was a, a many risks that I took. I moved our family multiple times. Um, it was always easier for me than it was for my bride uh, and with four young children to you know, to have new doctors and, you know, knew everything. And I got to go to work with a group of people that I became friends with right away. But I took the risk early in my career to say, I'd like to see what's out there. And uh, whether I succeeded or failed at that risk, it was well worth taking it because it never would have gotten me ready for the position at Secura had I not taken that risk early. At Secura, I took a few risks as, as well. We were, I was a senior VP of sales at one time, and then an operations position was open, and I marched into our former president and CEO's office, very brave, <laughs> marched in and said, I'd like to do that job too. And uh, he thought about it and gave me that opportunity. And by doing so, that allowed me to be ready more so for the CEO position eight years ago. So I think the part of career risk is important for all of us to take. As we said, you own your own career. And uh, the only way you know is if you experiment a little bit and say what you want to do and then go after that. Yeah, and from mine and Sam's perspective, I started more in a support role on our marketing team before transitioning over to the operational side of the business and joining underwriting. And this was a risk for me, not knowing exactly what I was getting into. And Secura was willing to take that risk on me as well. And Sam did a similar thing, starting in a, an operational side of things and claims before transitioning to a support role in project management. So we've both taken that risk and Secure has taken that risk on us and has given us that opportunity as well. We did hear that Bree kind of reduces some of that career risk by planning her vacations out where her <laughs> boss goes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Not true. Yeah. Not only do um, have Bree and I taken a career risk, but outside of our day-to-day -day job, Secura has given us the opportunity to also take risks with extracurricular things, such as hosting the Tell Talk today and being a moderator, um, joining uh, the Link Steering Committee with United Way and representing Secura, as well as building out our young professional network for 30 and under here at Secura are some additional risks side of our comfort zone that these guys sitting here have fully supported us as well as the company. All right, Dave, how have you handled failure in your career? Yeah, um, besides crying. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think failure is all a part of who we are as individuals, whether you go back to your youth and you missed out on a team opportunity or uh, trying out for the play or <laughs> doing anything as we grew up, right? And and that extends into work. And so for me personally, I tried to learn why I did not either handle the situation as well as I could have or why I did not get a position that I applied for. And, and it was a lesson learned. And I looked at who might have gotten it ahead of me 
and why did they get that? And why did I not? Or what did I have to still work on to be better for the next opportunity? It's not easy to fail. Um, at risk taking is both ways. But what happened for me personally was it, I believe it made me stronger. I tried for positions all over the country prior to Secura. Um, I tried all the way through to say, could I interview for something that was bigger or better or greater? And when I looked at it and I said that I missed out on the opportunity, I still tried to learn to be able to find the next thing that would fit me and my balance. You might have had to go back pretty far to, to find that failure piece yeah. for us because our organization is at 10 past years of the best profitability and the best growth. Yeah, you don't had, have so. to suck up. Any so more so yeah. <laughs> I only have five more days. You don't have to say that. So thank you though. All right, Dave and Garth, what suggestions do you have for emerging leaders on how to build their own succession paths? Yeah, it would probably come as no surprise. Step one for me is earn it where you are today. There's no better way to have an opportunity to do something else but then by being really good at what you're at today. I think I would add on to that too is, in, at least within our organization, it, it's vital that you build relationships with other people relationships with other leaders so people can see what you've done. I also believe that you're only going to get so far in your own ability. Leaders have to want to pull you up. And so if you're one who just uh, thinks you can do it and you're going to be seen and, uh, and you don't need to build relationships, I think that would be a little bit harder for you. So I would also say to focus on building relationships as you focus on doing something else with your career too. Yeah, that's awesome, Garth. I, I think about the question that I had before on failure. I think the one point that you made about making sure you network, I think I could have done that much better earlier on in my career. Um, I was so focused on my current role and then in transferring with my organization that I didn't build as many relationships as I could have. So I think it's critical. Um, whether that ever pans out for another uh, position for you or not, the, 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 the soft side of that is you become friends with more people in the organization. You walk a mile in their shoes. You understand what their position is. And that makes you a better person, a better leader ultimately as well. Dave and Garth, how do you maintain balance for yourself? And how do you ensure there is balance in the teams you lead? I'll start with that. Uh, so balance, uh, it's a word that we not just... Uh, talk about, but we try to model. Uh, so you see a photo of my family and my balance is my family, four children, three of them married, uh, five grandbabies today, even though there's only four in the picture. Um, I, I, I've been blessed with this amazing part of balance. And I, I think for when I translate that to work and I think about uh, this part of balance for our, all of our thousand associates is that at times, it's going to be out of balance, right? Your home is going to be out of balance or your work might be out of balance. And it's our job as leaders, but it's also our job as individuals to say when we are in or out of balance. And it's unrealistic to think that all thousand of us are perfect equilibrium, equilibrium at all times, but you have to open up your mouth and be able to say, I need help because my aging mother needs some more time from me. You know, certainly COVID has, has taken that to a whole new level of, of us saying that we can meet our associates where they're at and we can be a much more balanced company by saying that uh, Sam can get off the, uh, at, be at the bus stop for her children, where she can go to a sporting event, where we can think about how do we balance. So we try to emulate that as people and as leaders. And if we don't emulate that, then I think all of our people will look and say, well, you're out of balance, Dave, and, and why should I be in balance if you're not? And so we work really hard at the balance equation. Yeah, for me, I would just uh, go off of what Dave talked about. I think part of that leadership starts from the top and you have to model that behavior. And so under Dave's leadership, he's really shown the entire organization. This isn't a 24 seven type of a role that you need to have. You need to be really good at what you do. And you also, you, Secure wants you to be really good inside of Secure and outside of Secure as well. And I try to model that behavior as well. I work hard when I'm here and people also know that you're not gonna hear from me on Saturdays and Sundays. I have a lot of hobbies in my personal life too. And I love to do things with my family and my friends. Uh, you can see here, I've uh, got a family with two children and we're very active outside. And we also, uh, 
take a camping trip every year with a group of friends and we like to have a blast doing that. And this is a picture from us in the Outer Banks, all jumping up and celebrating and having a good time. So, uh, you know, no role is so important where you can't take your time off as well. Uh, part of that question was also, you know, how do you talk to others about this? And I can use an example of a person on my team named Katie, who's got three young kids. And I talk with her all the time about, you can only spin so many plates and spin them all well. Sooner or later, something's going to drop and we don't want the plates to drop. So focus on the work that really must be done, spin the plates really good at Sakira and ensure you're spinning those just as well at home because there's people in your home life that want you as well. So balance that all out equally. So again, I think as Dave talked about showing it as an organization that you want balance and then modeling that behavior. Yeah, and you as a, the CEO of your career, as you own that, you have to open up your mouth and talk about what your balance is, right? My balance is different than Garth's and, and yours is different than your boss's for that matter. So if you see something out of balance in your organization, it's up to you to say that. It really is, or that I can't take anymore. And, uh, and, and I think that give and take really opens up the door for greater communication overall, because I believe all of your companies want you as a balanced individual as well. Yeah. <laughs> so during COVID, we wanted to make sure as an organization, we continue to communicate with people. We knew all of the challenges that were there. And Dave did something where he sent a daily email out it basically is three o'clock email. And if you, you just read into all the stories of what was going on in his life and we just wanted to stay connected. So as a leadership group, we talked through that and, and Larry Wright, our head of claims, he and I decided we would come up with some type of a weekly Wednesday, just a fun little video series that we put together. And we always tried to tell something that was going on in the company, but then also do something fun with our little video. And we were the one take wonders. We were Hans and Franz, we did Wayne's World. You can see in the upper right, we were out in our pond swimming which didn't go over so well. We thought it'd be a lot easier than it was on those <laughs> kid size uh, wraps that we had, but trying to, you know, deliver the message, stay connected with people and have fun along the way. That was all important to us. And, and you see that here on a daily basis. Garth, I have a question based off of this. Was there any risk taking that went with going outside your comfort zone here? <laughs> Maybe a little, <laughs> but you know, I think for those who know me well, I'm serious about our business and the performance results we have, but I'm also a goofball who likes to have a fun time. So, you know, making sure I knew my lines uh, was, was one piece of it, but the other side of just having fun and saying, yeah, I'll do that was, was easy. Let's face it, we, we work a lot of hours together, right? With you, with all of your coworkers and, it would be boring if we just didn't have any fun at work. And, uh, you know, you spend a lot of hours together. So we try to lighten the mood, try to tie it to communication, as Gar said, and, and really say that we can make insurance fun. Um, those, those words don't always go together, <laughs> but here they do. All right. Well, due to the overwhelming response of pre-submitted questions, as well as questions that have come through during this presentation, we wanted to ensure that we allocated enough time to hear from Dave and Garth from the questions that you all had. So we're going to get started and asking them the pre-submitted questions we're going to start with. Dave and Garth, in this dynamic work environment, what are the top three challenges you are facing? Uh, I'll start with maybe one, Garth, and you can fill in the others if you'd like. I think the this part for competing for talent is tremendous for any organization. Now, we believe we get ahead of that as a company, but it's very difficult, right? To, um, COVID has taught us that people can work from home in their pajamas, a lot of different positions, and especially in a service industry like we are. Um, but in your industry, it may not be that way, but in ours, it is. And so when I look at that part of making sure that we take care of our people, that we really try to listen to them and understand their wants and needs. It was there before COVID and we believe that we have that culture, but it's, it's going to be an ongoing concern for us to make sure that we find and retain talent. Yeah, I would, I would add a piece to that. So for in, within our industry and for Secura specifically, uh, we need to be better in the technology space. And so as an organization, we have uh, lofty goals there and. And we, we just need to be better. We need to be more on par with uh, the digital world that we're in and our, uh, with that our industry is a little bit ahead of us on and we need to be better in the tech space. So that is one of our challenges. And then I'll add maybe the third because I think you asked yes. for three. So um, I think the part of maintaining your culture is really critical in today's workforce. And 
And uh, we all have different cultures. And, we, uh, and as we think about a hybrid workforce for us, to be able to make sure that our teammates who are possibly working part-time from home, part-time in the office, full-time from home, many of them, or just in the office that we still create and connect our culture to everybody. Uh, training is an issue always when you're doing much more remote training these days, but we can still have our culture come through by regular communications, uh, regular events that we have people come back into the office for. And so maintaining and, and growing that culture into its best is still always a challenge. I think I would add on to that culture piece that Dave talked about. So we've said, and Dave's been really good at modeling this to say, we don't have all these answers. So when COVID came, we would talk about our COVID messaging and openly say, we don't know, we don't have these answers, but as we learn more, we'll continue to learn and evolve. And we've talked about that with culture. We, we win with our people. We win with the culture that we have by this being a great place to work. But knowing exactly what that's going to look like over the next three to five to six years, we don't know. We just know that we want to continue to win with our culture and being a great place to work. And that'll continue to evolve for us. Thank you. Next question that we received, what different strategies are you using to attract new, new talent to Secura? How have your retention strategies changed over the past few years? All right, I'll take this. <laughs> but what I will say too is that for many years uh, w with the culture that we've had, we've been blessed that we have pretty low turnover. Uh, you know, we do a lot of benchmarking. We know our turnover is about half of what the industry is. And so no matter what leader you are at Secure, if you're at a different conference and people are talking about all their challenges with turnover and culture and things like that, we, we listen to those, but we haven't really had the issues with, with uh, recruiting and with turnover. But I do think that we have a conscious model. We partner with a few colleges and we, we've invested money into training programs. We train up, we train up new college hires to know our industry, to know claims, to know underwriting. We've got heavy investments there and they pay off for us. So we haven't necessarily yet to date had to do something new and different. We just have to continue to evolve with what we're doing. And as we continue to grow, have more and have more flexibility for multiple training programs, multiple classes and things like that. But we haven't had a 180 degree shift in what we're doing. Well, I add just a little bit to that on um, Kristen in our marketing area do, do a wonderful job of showing our heart and soul as to who we are as people uh, through social media, through connections all throughout the industry. And, and that we believe resonates with people as they think about uh, coming to work for Secura. It would resonate in your firm as well too, in that we try to let people uh, volunteer for anything that their passion is around. And uh, because we know the greater community needs it, you know, United Way is such an awesome example of that that we try to give back into the art, into the community because we're more than a balance sheet. We're more than a paycheck. We are certainly caring individuals that know that we have a wonderful thing here, but there are so many more people hurting and in need. And so I think when you combine that into your recruitment as an organization, that good things happen. You bring in a better quality of person who wants to work for an organization that has a heart and soul that we believe we have. Yeah, I add on to that too, Dave, that, you know, at Secura, it's pretty obvious that coworkers care about each other. And I think that comes through that mindset at the top, uh, wh whether you were the CEO or even when John Mikowski was CEO, we want to have high levels of engagement. And so we've been measuring culture. We've had culture measurements in place since 1998. Mm -hmm. and, and so that just shows we've thought culture was a big deal for a long time. So for those listening, I'm going off script a little here. Mm -hmm. For those that are listening that aren't a Secura associate, how would you recommend that they bring back to their company ways to improve their culture? Uh, so I'll start with that. I think there's many things that you can do. Um, it talks about taking some risk, right? If you, you have an idea that you think could make your firm better, um, or you network with somebody that talks about their work situation, and, and, and you hear an idea that you think would resonate uh, don't be afraid to go tell it to somebody. Tell it to your boss, tell it to HR, tell it to the president, CEO, tell it to someone, right? Do we do everything that our associates recommend to us? Absolutely not. We try. We try to think about how we can be better for all of our people. So I think you have to take that risk to say, 
I'd like to be, have some change here inside of my organization. And I'm going to be one who not just throws out the idea, but will lead it. If you, if you recommend and volunteer to lead it, uh, it's a whole different thing than if you just throw out ideas and see what hits the wall. So, Thank you. All right. Next question we have here is, have you used any trick to help a team member that is not as motivated as you to work hard for things and thinks they are entitled to the next step in their career? <laughs> Up here. I've used many tricks. Uh, yeah, I beat it in the wall. I don't know that I use trickery. I, I would probably instead say that I use transparency. And what I mean there would be that, you know, it could be a role that just isn't a good fit for a person, or it could be the organization isn't a good alignment. So I, I tend to talk to people about role, their leader, what they're interested in doing, starting at that highest level. Do you love Secura? Do you just not love your gig? Can we try to align something differently? But I still think this is going to be, you know, I'm going to beat that dead horse where for you to have an opportunity to do something else, you got to earn it in the role you're in today. Even if that one can be a drag on you, the best way for you to potentially get to do something else then is to be really good at what you're doing today so you can earn that opportunity. So again, for me, the trickery piece doesn't work as well as having that just honest conversation about what's working, what isn't working, how can we work together to try to make something different happen. And I'll just comment on one word that you had in that question, and that was entitlement. Uh, so never believed in entitlement, right? This part of something that I don't deserve or something that I haven't earned. And so as Gar said, the transparency conversations around why do you feel you're entitled to the next uh, position or next opportunity? Are you the best, as Garth had said? Are you the best in what you're doing? And, and uh, or do you need work there? Because entitlement for us is only an earned right. It's, there's a, uh, there's nothing free in this world and jobs are so precious, right? Your jobs are precious and every one of your companies look at you and say, we'd love to keep you. We'd love to keep you earning it and we'd love to promote you also, but it's not for free. So there's no entitlement here. Everything is earned. Yeah, if you were to take a, a walk through our building and walk on our monumental staircase, kind of the center hub walking up four flights, if you walk down to the lower level and you get off in the cafeteria, there's some great signage there and it says be real earn it and have fun so that that entitlement mentality uh, doesn't work here all right we have a question that was submitted how has the importance on diversity equity and inclusion changed how you lead or grow your teams Kurt, I'll, I'll start with that okay. if that so whether we're talking about d and i or um, or ESG or, or a sense of belonging, right? If you combine all of that into this role of what are we as human beings in this world and how do we treat people, um, that's how it's really changed and shaped us as leaders. Uh, we, we think about that much more so now than ever. We used to say we were a representative sampling of diversity of this area. And that wasn't good enough. That was that was weak in our approach as an organization. We kind of looked and said, Garth and I talking together for the last eight years said, we can be even better than that. So I'll let Garth talk about how we reach further for individuals into our, and then how we treat everybody here from a respect area and the associate resource groups that are forming. So Garth, if you'd like to handle that. Sure, I could. And I would also say, you know what, we, we talk about serving our associates and we ask questions around inclusion and belonging. And we have 90 plus percent of our associates on the most recent survey saying they feel a sense of belonging, they feel inclusion here. So that, you know, in terms of a pulse check, that is a good pulse check that we have. But as Dave said, just being the, the sampling of the community wasn't great enough for us or good enough for us. We, we also, you know, through Dave's work, we have, a, we're governed by board of directors and we talked at the highest level there to say we wanted to be more diverse as a board of directors as well. And so that's happened under Dave's leadership there too. But as an organization, we do look, we, we don't have uh, numbers and, and data and metrics that we have to hit on that line, but we know, do know that we want to be more diverse and, and more inclusive as an organization. With that, there's been a number of associate resource groups that have started. Um, or employee resource groups. And that's been a wonderful way for us to 
have a ground up thought process to how everybody is feeling here in the organization. And our management team is encouraged to attend, not to lead them necessarily, but to attend and to listen. Um, the listening part of a uh, sense of belonging for all is really critical. We've had days of listening, days of conversation with our associates. Those have been a wide eye-opening things for us to just hear where everybody's at today in today's world, and then to try to do something about it as well. Yeah, I think uh, the, the listening days that they've talked about have been really good for me. I, by nature, I would want to be a problem solver. So sitting and just listening for the 30 or 45 minutes it has been a good opportunity for me to learn and grow as well because it they, they're not asking or no one's asking for you to come up with a solution we just want you to listen we have a follow-up question to that one too do you think secura is a diverse company and if not what are you doing to improve diversity Well, I think that, that's a really good question. Do I think we're a diverse company? I do think we're a diverse company. And you, you could look at diversity in a tons of different measures. So if we talk about diversity of thought, we have diversity of thought all across our organization. Do we have diversity between the ratios of men to women? We definitely do. We've got more females working here than we have more than men. So, but when we talk about taking it down further levels from that, that's where we have work to do. We have more work to do. And, and some of that is involved with uh, focus, as I talked about earlier. We have a great relationship with a, a local university at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. We get 80% of our new college grads from that university. So we need to go deeper and farther reaching to show people of all colors that this could be a great place to work as well, instead of just relying on the one campus search that we primarily rely on. All right, next question. What considerations would you recommend to decide when to take the leap to a new career path? Particularly when moving from a stable corporate job to a freelance small business work. I can start with that. Um, so in that example of you know changing from uh, a corporate job to freelance, my advice would be to follow your passion. I, uh, we all have our individual passion for work and what we wanna do. So whether that's changing positions within a company or growing to the best that you can be inside that company or looking outside your organization, follow your passion. I, you know, um, if you work hard and have earned it, even if you fail at going to another position, what you're gonna learn there is gonna help you for the next spot. And I know it's not easy to fail, but I, I believe that's all part of our makeup of who we are as we aren't going to win at all times or be satisfied or happy at all times. So strive for that. Strive for that happiness. Strive for the ability to say, there's something else out there that I would like to follow my passion at, and I'm just going to go do it. Um, easier said than done financially, right? But but you can still protect those risks as well. So uh, be your best, but 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 be curious and, and take some risk as to what's next for you. Yeah, if I was adding on to that, yeah. you know, that's a, that's the, a big risk. You're talking about uh, taking something that's pretty stable for you, a stable paycheck and taking something that'd be more of an unknown. So being the planner that I am, I would hope that you'd have that planned out that you can afford a few months where your business might not be doing so well. And, and depending, I would also say it depends on what your background is, you know, if you work in tech, as an example, and you want to take this risk and it, and it fails miserably after a couple of months, you've got countless opportunities where you can go back into that tech space and be employed like that. So it's not as great of a risk as if you're in a, a role where there aren't that many opportunities for you. So I think the type of career risk that you're talking about and the role that you play uh, plays a part in that. At least it would for me. Thank you. Next question. When balancing a transition of leadership, how do you judge which elements of existing culture to keep and which elements to replace and evolve? Is this where I probably should leave the room? Uh, <laughs> this and, is and, where we let Garth like, take the it. Garth can take this and I'll leave and I'll close my ears. So you can get rid of any or add anything you want. So, <laughs> uh, For me, the hardest part and for the thousand of people who work at Secure and all of our agency partners and everyone that Dave has had a relationship with, Dave is loved by yeah, everyone. Hardly. He is. Everybody here would say that. And, and I'm not. 
So that, yeah. that's a little bit different. It's a different style. It is a little bit different style. And I think, you know, some, some of, uh, some of that risk taking would be a little bit different for me. And I'm sure that uh, the direct report team that I inherited from Dave would already potentially tell you they've seen some subtle differences there too, where, you know, I want to have more of a plan or more of a 10 year plan for us and, and markers along the way and strive to hit those. And, and yet some would say, you're crazy. We've had the, the best 10 year run we've ever had. And who are you to tell us we need a different plan to do that? So I don't want any elements of culture to change. We want to have a great culture. But there might be elements of what we create for business plan and how we execute on that plan that would look a little bit different. So I've got five days left still to work <laughs> on them. So um, I think the part of, and I believe we, uh, Garth and I both believe this, is if you take care of people, right, if you take care of your workforce and, and listen to them and try to be better, then good things are going to happen financially for your organization. And so I, I really think they're connected at the hip in today's world that if you treat people poorly or if you're treated poorly, you know what, you're not going to give your best, right? Because you're not going to say I'm going to be a hundred percent at all times because you're not listening or you're not taking care of me. So I think if you treat people, then the results come. And I believe we both believe that yeah. part of it. He may be more, planned out thought process than I am. But, but I know that when you take care of your uh, thousand employees that they're going to take care of your organizations and your customer base. So it's connected. All right. Next question. Both of you as leaders have excellent ability to persuade others. Mm -hmm. My question is, how did you improve these skills? Any tips or suggestions for those listening today that are seeking to improve in this area? Well, I know persuasion doesn't work very much at home, so uh, <laughs> I've learned on that side of it. Um, I uh, So uh, persuasion to me is just uh, opportunity presenting itself through your words, right? This part of not trying to force something in, but to be able to present who you are or the idea that you have um, and, and present it with facts and present it with the passion that you have towards that. To me, that's how things get done, right? If Garth comes to me with a, uh, something that he uh, wants to lead and secure and, and he doesn't believe in it or he's not like fully engaged in that idea and I can see it's just a, you know, a half slung idea, then I'm probably not gonna take him seriously. If he, if he has the passion to it and, and, and he's trying to convey to me how important that is, I don't look at that as persuasion. I think we all manage all directions, right? We manage down, we manage sideways, we manage up, and that's persuasion at any of those levels, right? Whether you're trying to get your associates to do something, whether you're trying to get your, your peers to do something, or whether you're trying to get your boss to do something, this part of persuasion is to me um, properly prepared communication. And I think then it gets done. Yeah, I would add on that, that word of the belief. If I have a strong belief about something and I have the, you know, enough data to, to back up the belief, I believe I can be persuasive. Might not get it done in round one, but I also be, believe there's some grit and perseverance with that. And I can use, <laughs> Dave knows where I'm going with this. When we uh, put the proposal in front of our board of directors to approve building a new building, uh, we went over two. On the third try is when we were successful, but I had the belief, we had a belief as an organization and what we would need as a physical space to support the growth of the organization. And so at the end of the day, we persevered and got that through. It was a strong belief in what we needed and I could be very persuasive. If I don't believe in something, it's super hard for me to persuade anybody to do it because I really don't believe, and you could see it, that I don't believe in it and not, it's hard for me to persuade you to do something then. Yeah, we struck out twice, not just with the board of directors on the new facility. Um, we struck out with our internal team. My direct reports, not everybody was on the same page on that either. Some saying too expensive, some saying, you know, that we can take those dollars and use them elsewhere in the organization. All true statements, right? That, and yet as we were thinking about how to be a billion dollar organization at the time and what space needs what we have, we both had the passion for it and really conveyed that persuasive nature through facts of, you know, we were almost having to bunk bed associates in our old place and, 
And we're, we're lucky that we got it all done before COVID because I think it would have been a harder um, sell to our board uh, once COVID hit. Um, certainly construction costs would have escalated as they have for everybody in today's world. And so we're thankful that we got it done before COVID because this is also this wonderful facility on 200 acres that people want to come back to now as well and all paid for, which is wonderful. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right, we received a submission. Do you always know that you wanted to be a CEO someday? Did you always know this? You or me first. Go ahead. All right. Uh, so the answer to that is I did not know that I wanted to be a CEO. I, I'm not one that had set like one, three, five, 10, 20, five-year career goals. I never could wrap my arms around that part of just the structure of that. Instead, I wanted to perform well and then be rewarded and promoted for that performance. So I, I believe I live that part of it to say that if an opportunity comes, then you're best prepared by, li by living and acting that way. But I never thought I would be a CEO. I, my father was a claims adjuster in insurance all his life. For, and uh, and so, um, so I came through having a dad who was in insurance, not ever understanding I'd be in insurance. And I got involved in insurance then in 1980. And so for 42 years, it's been my pleasure to be uh, working in this great industry, but also as the last eight years as CEO, uh, but I would never have planned for it three ever. No. Yeah, me either. So uh, I uh, led internally as part of HR, led the CEO search process from an internal perspective for our board of directors uh, when Dave became CEO. And then I was working that same path for Dave, working on CEO succession candidates with him when Dave asked me, would you want to consider this as an opportunity? And I believed that, yes, I would want to, but it wasn't something I definitely had as a career path because I believe there are other people who are just as good, if not better than me. And so with Dave's nudging and Dave's suggestion, then I put my head in the ring and became candidate. Here we are. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Still yeah, that's right. Days, that's right. So, yeah. <laughs> so then to just build off that question, for those that are listening today, there's only typically usually one CEO in a company. So if you're owning your own career path, what's that nugget of advice you'd want them to walk away with today before we wrap up? I'll go first on okay, that. please. For me, it wasn't about being CEO. And I ended, uh, you know, we had to put business plans together in interviews with our board of directors. And I would not say being CEO is, is what your goal should be to define your happiness. To me, that wasn't it at all. I ended by saying, I'm very thankful. I have high level of gratitude to the organization that I work for. And I said this, I said, if I get this opportunity, that's awesome. If I don't get it though, I am still all in because I love the role that I have and really like the organization that I work for. So for me, it wasn't about the only role I'm going to be happy in is to be CEO. And I know we're going to uh, sum up on some of these things, but for me, it's this part of working hard and being balanced that we talked about that, that, that to me is the CEO right here, that if I'm happy in my head, in my position, my work and family life, this balance to me means I'm my CEO of my time, my efforts, my family, my all that I am as an individual. That part of balance is really critical for me. One more quick question before you do your last nuggets of advice. What or who inspires you to be a great leader? I'll start. I, so I'm not a big uh, self-help reader of books. I have never done much of that, although I give uh, lots of people credit for doing that. The, the constant studying of how to be a better leader is a wonderful part. And so for me, it was at a young age of uh, wonderful role models of older brothers that that set the example for our family and and uh, that was incredible this inspiration that I got from them led me into my you know from my teen years into college and beyond that part of it but it it was a hard-working father and mother that was my inspiration that my mother will be 97 and and that she's still my inspiration. I still call her so she can yell at me and be a mother still. And, and uh, but she's amazing that this inspiration of all their hard work for their children, for their careers, uh, for whatever they chose to do in life with us and for us. So 
that was my inspiration. It, it made me a better individual. Yeah, mine is very similar. It's family. You know, I raised the, my mom and dad, there were four kids. There were no silver spoons. If you wanted it, you go get it, you go earn it. And I've always had that drive. I've always had the drive where I wanted to win and uh, win in life and, and be successful, whether it was athletics or whether it's, it's in the workplace. And so I think it's just that, that inner drive, but I think part of that came from how I was raised with my family. Okay. Thank you. All right, then to wrap up, we're gonna have Dave and Garth just share some of the common themes that we discussed today. Um, all off to you two. Sure, I'll start off by just that portfolio model. Take the risk, it's, it's worth it. If you're in a role, if, if you wanna try something else, you've got an itch, I would encourage you to, to explore it. Explore it with your supervisor, explore it with other leaders and take that risk. Yeah, be your best right at whatever that is. So the second thing that we wanted to talk about is just this growth mindset of you as an individual that there's a, don't be so tunnel visioned in what you are in your position. Um, look outside of your current role, look outside of your company and be the best that you can be And that. That constant seeking of knowledge of what is that person doing over there? And maybe I could do that or, or how can I be better at my position and, and be more ready for a promotion the next time around. So have a growth mindset of who you are as an individual. That can be textbook growth, can be experiential growth, it can just be knowledge growth. And so um, have that growth mindset and I think that will help you always. Um, another one is network. So we talked a lot about networking today and that advantage, and this is a networking association, right? If you think of United Way and Emerging Leaders and Link, um, I know many of you are attached to both of those um, or you're a wannabe attachment. We uh, will take uh, checks right now. Can I, we have sign off right now? But I, I, I think about that part of, of connecting, connecting to greater people, for knowledge, but for friendship as well too. Connecting to those most in need in the community through volunteerism, connecting outside of who you are, stretching yourself to know somebody better in the organization. Some would look at that and say, that's just sucking up, right? It's, it's doing this, but that's not a, at all. You're gonna gain knowledge. They're gonna know your desires and hopes for what you wanna do inside your organization. So network as much as you can because only you will be the benefit of that. Yeah, and I would close it out with a theme we've talked about on balance. Know what it is for you and prioritize that in your life. I do that. I, I talk here about, you know, spinning those plates as we talked about. You can only spin so many and we want every plate that you spin here at work to be just as good as those plates you spin outside of work. So identify that balance and prioritize it. So we also want to close out by just thanking everybody for dialing in. We know an hour of your time is worth a lot and want to thank you for it. And now we're gonna transition over to emerging leader Mel Garretts to close us out. Thank you, Garth. Um, so thank you all for attending today. I know like Garth said, taking an hour out of your day can be extreme, um, but we really appreciate your time. If this is your first look at emerging leaders, uh, we do have a few upcoming social events um, and different things that you can learn a little bit more about emerging leaders. So we have our emerging leaders social event coming up on May 4th. And Emerging Leaders Ask Me Anything on May 12th, which is really uh, who we are and what we do, um, both very casual events. And then like Brenton talked about in the beginning, we have our reimagined Valentine's Family Festival, which is the EL Spring into Summer Festival. It's a fun free event coming up on May 14th at Memorial Park, so bring your families. Um, additional information for that can be found if you scan the QR code on the right side of your screen or um, check out the website. Additionally, we have some fun link events like Samantha talked about in the beginning. Uh, we have our Get to Know Link event coming up on May 4th and the Link Social event on May 18th. Um, go ahead and scan that QR code or visit the um, Fox Cities United Way website as well to get registered for those events and find out a little bit more. So again, I want to encourage you all to follow us on any of our social media platforms um, and also want to thank Dave and Garth for all of the time that they took to put into this event. Um, the outcome that we had with the registration is phenomenal and 
I hate to say that it's probably one of our, our top ones so far. So I don't want to get ahead of myself there. Um, but then also to Sam and Bree, thank you so much for all of the effort and time that you put into this. Obviously instrumental in coordinating this. Um, and thank you all for joining us. We obviously couldn't have done this without you guys. And I look forward to seeing you at our upcoming Emerging Leader events. Thank you.